First of all, I'm so sorry, guys. I actually have a couple of videos. Now, I will quote them. I won't be able to play them because I would have to do a lot of charade because they're actually brand stories. But um, if you want to come to me afterwards, I can give you the links and you can watch them in the safety of your own home. Um, it's great to be here. Um, Thank you, and it's, it's, it's a little daunting to come up here and talk after life and, and after David, um, because um, I really don't do that much public speaking anymore. Um, I really enjoyed it, and um, I think what happened was when you start getting right into the weeds, and all of you know that 24 hours of your day are in your day job, and you're actually catching yourself, not having time anymore to spend time with a community of bright people and get challenged and have these conversations, but trying to figure out what this darn 21st century actually is and, and how we have to behave. And you do that on a day-to-day -day job with brands, with clients, with companies. Uh, it's not theoretical. It's not just a mind bingo. It's actually true work, true projects, true money. So I'm delighted to be here. I decided to step out of the rat race. I took three months off. It's the scariest thing you can ever do, especially in the middle of a recession. Everybody looks at you and says, you are mad. Um, didn't matter because most people think I'm mad anyway. Um, and not only that, I stepped totally out of social media because I went and restored a old farmhouse from 1690, somewhere in Cambridgeshire. And if any of you have been in Cambridgeshire, Phone reception is not something that Cambridge is really known for. So it was wonderful. And I came back and I got an invite from Angel saying, can you talk to us about social media? And I was like, better make something up fast. <laughs> so the other thing which I find really funny today is um, for most of the 20 years that I've been in the industry, I've always been the digital girl, which is very, very exhausting. And it's probably something that some of you can relate to. Being the digital guy or being the digital girl is generally the one or used to be the one who was caught at the very end. When people went like, ah, hmm, well, we need to do something. And the CEO said they want an app. Or um, the website's not really working. And, and actually, we didn't tell our customer service that we are doing some help. And it's not very fulfilling. It becomes very fulfilling if you're a fixer and if you love fixing and if you run on the drill in them. It's not really fulfilling if you actually want to change a tiny, a little wee bit of the world. So I'm going to show brand videos today. I'm actually going to show TV ads, and I'll tell you in a minute why. Um, in a nutshell, over the last couple of years, I had this insight that really I think our industry got completely and utterly lost. And the reason we got lost is because we came up to a good start. Brands were always part of culture. They always played a role in culture. And then the internet came up. And we went like, sugar, we have to figure this out, OK? And what we did is we actually totally and utterly out-digitalized ourselves. So it was all about who's more fabulous, who gets digital more, who is more out there, who is working with all of these channels, who who's doing the next crazy stuff, OK? Um, if I speak too fast, please slow me down. It's one of my habits, and I do that. That generally works very well. My boyfriend does that about five times a day. <laughs> Don't do that. I get very annoyed when you do that. <laughs> so, and it was a real pity that we were spending so much energy in doing that, because really, technology should have helped us to leverage and to enrich the brands and to create actually shared value and to create purpose for both people and companies. And yes, make money. There's nothing wrong in making money. So I'm having two things to control here. Um, it's a myth that women can multitask. It is a real myth. I can't multitask. So I think what ended up was that we focused to making better advertising, where we had an opportunity to really focus on making advertising better if you know what I mean. It was all about the tools. It was all about the methodology. It was all about the technology. So when Angel invited me, I thought, wow, what could be a really, really tricky subject? And I thought, maybe we can all together here. I don't have the answer. I'll tell you that immediately. If I had the answer, I wouldn't have to speak anymore. 
what could be the role of brands in shaping the world that we all want? Okay, what could that role be? And how could we get there? So let's talk about that and let's talk about how can that help brands with what they're looking for, which is staying relevant, which is incredibly important, but also help us because we really want to make sure that the world that we have at the moment is improving. A lot of research is showing that we as, an, uh, as a community are becoming more aware that there's a lot of young people who want to change, they want to be involved, they want to really use all of their skills. I mean, life said it earlier on. I want to make things that didn't exist and yes, you know, I want to make the world a little better because we have all of these amazing resources. So in order to get back to that, I want to take you on a little history trip back avenue on advertising. Just bear with me, it won't be very, very long. But actually, this is not new, okay? Brands were always at the heart of culture. They couldn't necessarily do that much because, as David was saying, all they were doing is they were talking at people. They might be able to tell you a message, but nothing really happened afterwards. And the more money they had, the more often you hit the message, but then you're kind of left alone with it. So. It was also the time where people could not really relate to companies, okay? We didn't know what was happening in companies. And also companies didn't really know how to let us know what happened within them. So that's how advertising kind of really simplistically got invented. It was a channel of a company telling you, hey, we have something that might be really interesting for you. But as there's more and more messaging around that, obviously people got a little cynical and they got quite critical. And, you know, somebody said it earlier on, who believes advertising? I want to counter that and says who believes Google, but that's a completely different discussion. And if you get down and dirty into Google algorithms, then you realize that reality are lots of realities. And again, there is not one truth and there is not one objective reality out there. What happened then when people realized advertising is actually not really working, you can't just tell people that your product is awesome, is what I always call the first creative revolution, and it was the people of Bill Bernbach, uh, DDB, who started to go, we need to do storytelling. Storytelling is not new. It really started there. We need to create stories that entice people to start talking and about our products and trying them. And I want to show you um, a film, and apologies again, I can try to replay it. Oh, fantastic, because I cannot pretend to be a snowplow. A snowplow. I can try to. Um, that's a double click, uncle, isn't it? Or a triple click? No. Have you ever wondered how the man who drives a snowplow drives to the snowplow? This, this is one a... drives a Volkswagen. What a cool story. So you story. can stop wondering. such a cool story. It is something that we can all relate about. Just imagine if that ad would have been made now, how you could amplify that, how you could start conversations, how people would relate to it. I mean, I'm from Germany. I relate to that. My father lives very close to the Black Forest, and he drives a Mercedes and not a VW, and he has to wait until the snowplow comes. So what an awesome insight into people's culture, into people's life. And then as mass communication started to evolve, brands started to also realize it's not so much just about the product, it's becoming more and more about the brand, life was talking about it. And it is becoming really interesting to look deeper into culture and to maybe be very daring and have a point of view. Ooh, having a point of view, dangerous, huh? It's getting even more dangerous nowadays. Having a point of view is very dangerous because the internet never forgets. And we as human beings change our point of view, but the internet doesn't. So if you go back into your digital history, you'll find your point of view from five years ago. For politicians, that's a really bad thing. <laughs> but um, think about brands. Think about brands who are actually now harvesting that. Now, now we are talking about the 90s and we're talking about the beginning of 2000. 
try, is it double click again? Yeah. So that is for Purcell. It's a laundry detergent. It's washing powder. This is pretty strong, huh? And if you have a brand who puts a lot of money behind that, Purcell managed to change legislation in Indonesia, in schools, to acknowledge that kids need time off and need to play within the school diary. Now, that makes an impact. And again, that was developed when there was hardly any social media. So again, just imagine how that could have been imploded, activated, what, what amazingness can happen. And I know that Unilever is currently figuring out how to make this bigger and how to keep that great storytelling. And then the last one on this route into History Lane is again one that you probably all know. computer will introduce Macintosh and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. Goose pimples, huh? I mean, maybe I'm just very sobby, but it touches me. And I think that is what brands can still do amazingly well if they have great people with great passion and great creative. But it doesn't stop there. So I think the reason why these ad happens were because it was really people who developed an external visualization of their values and their purposes. And there were fiercely passionate brand teams who truly believed that their brand had a role to play in culture and society. That was personal. I have the honor to know Alini Santos, who is the VP of Laundry. It's a fantastic title, isn't it? VP of Laundry. Um, as a VP of Laundry at Unilever, um, and she is one of the most inspirational women I've ever met. And she has believed that Unilever, with its power, with its product, has a duty to actually turn it into a power in society, in creating culture, in changing cultural beliefs, and helping women to understand that they don't have to be tiger moms, of giving kids the opportunity to get dirty because, hey, what is it? Okay, it all goes out in the wash. Do they sell washing powder? Yeah. Is that a bad thing? No. So, however, all of that was still very, very much reliant on creating an external brand image. And it talked at consumers, and very much we counted, what did we do? We looked at recall, and we did at awareness to drive sales. Because at that time, that was really all we could do. And then social media hit us with a fundamental shift in regard of power and transparency. And I think it unfolded very slowly to us 
to, to show us what we could do in communicating and creating and in collaborating. And it took years. I mean, I don't know who's been around then, but we really learned every month something new. And we learned because people tried it and it didn't quite work. And now you tried again and it worked. And then we had the copycats and they kind of were okay. I like copycats because they give the C-suite the feeling that it's becoming okay to do it. And then you have to be brave again to push it further. So, however, I think what we were still struggling with was what did that actually mean to us as human beings? What did that mean to us in changing what we wanted to change, which is our culture, our society, and what role brands could actually play in that? So, you remember those ones? God, I drew a lot of those. I made a lot of money with those, okay? So what the brands did and companies, they went and asked for social media strategy, they asked for digital agencies, and you drew up all of those ecosystems. Okay, now, hands up, who has drawn them, being very proud of themselves? I mean, I have to put probably 45 amps up. The challenge with this is that's important, that's really important because it's somehow your operating model. But what it doesn't cover is what it means for you as an organization, for a brand, for a company, for the people who work there. What is it that you use it for? It's literally just roads. I love it when you walk into the building here and you have all of those um, streets, right? When you're in the, in the free fall and you kind of walk around, you pretend you're a toy car. I did that yesterday and people kind of looked at me quite strangely. But it's lovely, but I have no idea where I'm going. I have absolutely no idea where I'm going. And I think that's what, what happened. Um, we did that, right? Paid, owned, earned, social. It's all right. Nothing wrong with it. But it didn't answer the question. It didn't answer the question because all we did is we digitalized, okay? We didn't change. We took the behaviors that we've always had and turned them into digitalized. It's the same thing when brands talk about humanizing. It puts a shiver down my spine. Because if you humanize, you're not human. Do you put a layer of humanity over it? Do you put a layer on digital over things? Is it like fairy dust? You just sprinkled it and suddenly everything is fine? I think it would be wonderful if it was so, so easy. But that's what we did. We kept happily digitalizing behaviors that we knew best. So we realized, ooh, there's a conversation. Ooh, we need to be part of that. But we didn't really believe we needed to be part of it. We thought we need to be part of it because it's happening. So brands started to go in there. And I don't know, I mean, um, I don't really like parties anymore, but I used to. And do you know those guys who come to a party? Um, they're not really invited, but they kind of invite themselves. Uh, but you've never seen them, so you're a bit curious. And you're actually talking to them. And you kind of go, hmm, we'd like to figure out who you are. And you say, but they're always a bit awkward. They always stand in the corner, you know. I know a lot of brands who do that and who still do that, okay? And then the other ones which are actually a little sad. They're the kids who have to give you candy and sweets for you to invite them to your birthday party. Like my Facebook, and I will send you offers. Yeah, if it was only that easy. So I think, why did that happen? I'm not, I was there myself, so I'm not there and saying, oh my God, I think it was a natural, a very natural behavior because we had to learn it. But where things went a little wrong was the decision of getting involved with the audience was not based on a shared understanding or on shared values. It was based on a digital strategy or an immediate decision. And it was very often solely based on that. So we didn't really understand the real impact of social media and technology. Um, what we did, we changed everything, but we really didn't change anything. Okay, and a couple of examples, and you probably find yourself in them again. Every single one, I need to do a big tick into my life. I've done every single one of those. Okay, so we talked engagement, but we measured reach. Yeah, and then we had these discussions. How can you measure engagement in reach? And you kind of go, wow, this is getting really complicated. My brain is exploding. Um, we talked, we don't do TV anymore. TV is dead. I hate that. We had a massive discussion about that over, over lunch yesterday. TV is not dead, and if anybody tells you, just go, no. Visual storytelling, and you just saw that, is the most strongest part of getting people the most. I don't care what it is. The publishers will change. The content providers will change. But the actual act of television, which means looking at something from the far, 
will happen. It's actually happening more than ever before because we have more devices. Direct marketing became Facebook, okay, I mean the amount of brands that I developed Facebook apps for, I can count up. I believe that I would never ever have to work anymore if I had really managed to invent the self-destructive microsite. Okay, how awesome would have been that? I did an example one day because I was really bored and my boyfriend wasn't really in a good mood and I sat down and I googled all of the old products that Unilever didn't have on shelf anymore. But the microsites are all still there. It's like a graveyard of brands. It's amazing. Do it when you get very bored. Um, it's fabulous. And then we started something really, really vicious. Five minutes. I'm getting told off, so we're cutting halfway away. We did something very vicious, which is we also started to argue. So we didn't figure it out, and rather than getting all together and trying to figure out, we then went like, who's doing it the best? Is it the consultancies? Is it the Twitters, is it the Googles? And um, we talked about it yesterday. I spent a lot of time with Google um, getting told off by my own agency, okay? You cannot talk to them because collaboration, remember, there's two definitions of collaboration. There's the definition of action of working with somebody to produce something, but there's also the definition of treacherous cooperation with an enemy. Yeah. And I think we get that confused at times, very much so. So, what do we know? We need to let go, and I don't sing, I promise you, I don't sing. But I think we need to get low, and I think we need to realize people don't look for friendship. They're looking for authenticity and for relevance, okay? And it's not about ownership, okay? The moment you feel you own something, you lost it. And I know I feel a little zen on you now, but it's actually business. If you own something, you've kind of lost the opportunity to do something amazing with it. So. Look at that, it's dangerous territory. Getting into culture of the dangerous territory because we are all very protective about it. Look what Al Gore, uh, Gore Vidal says, entertaining commercials are effectively stealing human culture and creativity and injecting it into brands and products. When does that happen? If it isn't authentic, if it isn't real, if it isn't personal, okay? But on the other side, people realize, you know, you need to do something, but be careful about our wording. Infiltrating culture? I don't think sounds right. And I think when brands talk about infiltration, it shows a little bit of their mindset. Okay. Now, if you look at Todd, who said brands need to be socially relevant and penetrate culture in an authentic way, that already sounds much better. I kind of trust. I think this could go well. But be careful what you're doing, because the danger is that we do the same thing with that than what we did with digital before. So. That's my recommendation. I think for companies it is to get personal, to participate and integrate into culture in your own audience and to share the values and the language, to celebrate the history, champion the heroes and contribute to their stories. And I think what the way to do that is, it actually starts with you. Yeah, everything started with the companies. We then went out to the audiences because we needed to tell them something. Suddenly the audiences were playing back to us what they believed us to be. And we thought that was really important. Yeah, that was. But you can't ask somebody else to do your job. Your job is to go back and really define what it is that you stand for. And then create a cultural ecosystem. Create an understanding, a roadmap, a DNA of what you really stand for. And then think about how you operate that. I think we just done it the other way around because it was easier, because it was more about technology and we got all a bit hyper excited. Um, I want to show you one last video ad before um, Angel is kicking me off the stage. And I need to... Un we don't know, did anybody see that? This one, that one can and gold. Um, gold and can even. And I just need to tell you in a little bit, it's an, uh, it's an Indian ad and it is a jeweler brand. And watch it very carefully. The agency got death threats for it. The company got death threats for it, and I just explained to you in a minute why. Two, three, no. Is it doing it? It's not one of my core competences. Do I need to wait again?
To understand that it is a total taboo in India to remarry when you have a child. Women are expected to never remarry again. This caused one of the biggest cultural debates in India last year. And I didn't show you all the awesome social media because I knew everybody else is showing it. David, just link what David was talking about with that. And I think then we really get to where we want to be, where we make impact, we tell stories. We let our audience tell their stories. And we create that really rich tapestry. And actually, what is a rich tapestry called that is existing out of stories? It is called culture. It's one of the definitions that you find in a um, dictionary. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much.